Afternoon, everybody. <laughs> yes, uh, I'm Tim, and I did travel here from Canberra. Uh, this is my first time in KL. Uh, I've had a really good time here in the city. I love it. I hope I can come back. Uh, I help run a company called Ice Lab. We're mostly based in Australia. Uh, we're a design studio. Uh, that's the team right here. So there are 16 of us, and about eight of us are writing Ruby day to day. And I just want to say thanks to them because they've given me a lot of time to uh, help put together some of the things I'll be sharing with you today. Also, need to say thank you to these people, my family. I consider them my number one sponsors. Um, they've also given me a ton of support. Now, out in the Ruby community, you'll find me in places like these. Uh, I'm a core team member on the DryRB and ROMRB projects. Now, with all that done, before we dive into our topic today, I want to talk a little bit about classical art. Um, here's a painting for you. This one's from 1893, and that's a, a pretty harrowing scene, right? Here's the title. Programmers at work maintaining Ruby on Rails application. <laughs> Oil on canvas. Uh, this is actually from a very amusing Tumblr blog called Classic Programmer Paintings. And for someone who had worked in Ruby for a long time, this one hit really close to home. I mean, just look at those eyes. She has seen some things. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I think, I think this hit me so hard because a lot of the time, when we work with a language aimed towards programmer happiness, our day-to-day -day life kind of feels the opposite, maintaining big apps. Once apps get to a certain size or a certain age, uh, our efforts on them give us diminishing returns. Everything feels tightly connected. Changes in one place have unexpected ramifications in another. Every change I go to make on apps like these takes longer than the one before. Now, starting fresh, on new apps, uh, maybe a reprieve from time to time, but it, it's short-lived. And repeat this for long enough, and it's enough to make you feel like it's time to change careers, or maybe change programming languages, as if that'll solve all your problems. Well, it turns out a lot of thinking has gone into this kind of issue. And in fact, Martin Fowler's wrapped it up quite tidily in what he calls his design stamina hypothesis. And this lets us chart our work effectiveness over time. So that depressing scene from before, well, you can sum it up in a line like this. At the beginning, we feel like we're making good progress, but then over time, our efforts really flatten out. We become less effective. And this is what happens when we build an app and find ourselves in this place where we haven't put enough thought into its design. And yes, the Rails way is not a remedy for this. In fact, many could argue it focuses a lot on that initial um, spike, but with not enough um, for you in the long run. And this line here is the one of sadness. It's of the tired, frustrated developer. And for me, it's a line I, I sat on for a really long time. Whereas over here, we have this tantalizing red line. This line, it, you see it takes a bit of time to ramp up, but then it shows work on an app continuing at a nice, steady clip at a sustainable pace. And this is the line of good design. It's a line that shows what can happen when we make the decisions up front that will allow us to more clearly arrange all the elements that go into our app. And this one is the line of happiness. So when we consider these two lines and, and where they intersect, we see this design payoff moment, or as they say, the life comes at you fast moment. This pretty much is the point in time after which you wish you'd gone back and, and made some different design choices. And what I want to show you today is, is one way to move from the sad line up there to the happy line, at least a way that's worked for me. Now, in getting to this point, I had tried many times over to make this jump myself. And what I'd always look to are these object-oriented design principles. These are the things that should guide us as Rubyists, right? I know I'd go and watch the conference talks about these sorts of principles, and I'd see all that nicely arranged code, and I'd say to myself, yes, this is how I'm going to write my applications. But then I'd go back to those apps, and I really struggled to apply those principles to my actual living code. So I, I found myself in this gap between my desires and my realities, between the way I wanted to write code and the way my tools were, seemed to be encouraging me to write my code. 
and I couldn't find a way to bridge it. And really, all those principles just seemed to be taunting me more than anything else. So, as you might guess, I, I did find a way out, and, and it happened by following a, a different kind of approach. So everybody, uh, stand back. This is what I want to tell you today. Here we go, in a nutshell, functional programming will save us. <laughs> now, here we get to the actual title of my talk. I'm not going to suggest we all jump ship. Um, this is the Ruby conference after all. Um, so I want to talk to you about real-world functional Ruby. And since we're here in Malaysia, I thought maybe this is a better title. Functional Ruby can. <laughs> and I'll be showing you how we can take a functional approach to, to working with Ruby and how we can actually go out and apply an approach like this in our real working apps today. So to start with, well, why a functional approach at all? Well, clearly it's because we're behind the times and we've got to catch up. We need to stay on trend. Functional programming is hot right now, right? Like, and I've learned a bit about hot while I'm here in Malaysia. Now, when it comes to this, though, I think functional programming is actually hot for a good reason. It gives us clarity and understanding how something is pieced together. It can let us easily understand the flow of data from place to place. And it gives us a manageable way to build big things out of smaller pieces. So why shouldn't we have that in Ruby 2? Because it's a flexible language after all, and some elements aren't too removed from uh, functional concepts. So I think the first step we need to take towards a functional approach in Ruby is a change in mindset. It's about viewing your app as a series of transformations. Data goes into our app, in this many cases, um, the data being a HTTP request, and then it gets worked on over a number of steps and transformed along the way until at the other end we get our HTML. So if we think about an app modeled as a series of transformations, it's really an app modeled as a series of functions. And this is where we get to the functional part of functional Ruby. We can model these nicely as functional objects. Now, I want to take you uh, through a tour of a functional object right now. And here we go. Uh, we're going to make a start. Today, we're building a, an import products class. So if we were making some kind of online store, we'd use a class like this to populate our own product database from some feed of third-party product information. And even in the code we see here to, right now, this is the first quality of a functional object. It can usually be named by a verb. It's a verb, as we saw in the NLP talk, because it represents some action we want to take with regard to our products. And next, we can give it a call method, just like Ruby's own language level function equivalents, uh, procs and lambdas. Now, occasionally, we might want an object with a, a bigger API than this, but a lot of the time, call is all we need. And then we want this call method to accept an input do some work, and then return an output. Now, over the course of that method call, it shouldn't mutate the object's state, and it shouldn't mutate that input data either. And this is one of the big departures we make from a classical object-oriented approach, because here, our functional objects separate data from behavior. They don't keep that data, input data, anywhere in their own state. In fact, we reserve the state for something a bit more interesting, for the object's own dependencies or configuration, things that will never need to change. And effectively, this makes our functional objects immutable. And this is a big part of the design approach we're taking. Because when we make our objects immutable, we take away the whole dimension of time from when it comes to understanding our objects. We know that once they have a certain state, that's the state they'll keep always. So we can pass that around, pass those objects anywhere around our application, and they'll remain the same. And this goes a long way to improving the overall simplicity of our apps. Now, before we go any further, let's take a quick look at what this method is actually going to be doing. So we'll start by getting uh, a list of all the product information records by downloading a feed. And then we'll loop over them and work with a product repository to create copies of those products in our own database. Now, this is a pretty clear and simple method to read, isn't it? And that's because it's delegating a lot of its work to some dependencies. And it's an approach like this uh, which allows us to break our objects down into smaller, more usable, and easier to understand units. So here are those dependencies again, the download feed object and a product repository. And here, those dependencies can go and show the next trait of a functional object. They get passed in via the initialize method, and then we capture them in the object state. And once they're set, they'll never need to change. 
And what we're seeing here, in fact, is constructor dependency injection, which is a classical object-oriented uh, technique that actually works to great effect with our functional objects. And the result of all this is that we can now create our functional object just once, passing in those dependencies, and then we can use it many times over with many different inputs and in varying contexts. And once this object is constructed like this, it can also be passed around itself and go on to be the dependency of other objects in turn. Now, looking at this, you might be thinking, well, this is just one of the service objects that, we're, that we know we should use in Ruby apps these days when we feel like we have more complex behaviors to model. And yes, this is exactly right. But what I'm proposing here is that we use this approach to build out the entirety of our application's functionality. Because we want to set a comprehensive and consistent design approach, one that's easier for us to follow as we go and build our app. So all of the CRUD objects and actions that we're used to building, well, they can be functional objects too, and organized like this so that they're grouped by their context. In fact, every single feature or piece of behavior in our apps can now be expressed as a functional object. And the more complex they are, the more likely we'll want to break, them, break their behavior apart across multiple objects, which we can then bring back together and coordinate at a high level, just like we have done with our example here. So that's how our functional objects take care of the behavior side of things. But how do we handle our data? For this, we can turn to types. And this is Ruby, of course, so these aren't really the capital T types that we might expect to see in other functional programming languages. Instead, uh, I'm really talking about modeling our data as value objects. So a value object is just an object that holds a particular structure of data from our application's business domain. And just like our functions, we treat these objects as immutable. They get initialized with their data, and from that point on, they should never change. And of course, we can add behavior to these objects in classical object-oriented style by using extra methods that work with the values we already have. Now, we saw before we were making the verbs in our app, these are the nouns. Um, we're looking at a product here. And if we're, if we're used to working with active record um, to provide the noun classes in our app, well, take note, because these are the complete opposite. They are inactive. And the nice thing about this is that we can now easily pass them all around our application without having to worry about unexpected mutations or behavioral side effects along the way. And this allows the value objects to become first-class objects in our system. All of our functional objects can depend upon and work with these structures. So in a Ruby app built in this style, our objects tend to break down into these two categories, values and functions. The values hold data, and the functions operate on that data. Functions are active, going to work on inert, passive values. And if the values are the content in our system, the functions form the pipeline through which it flows in order for us to achieve some sort of outcome. So that's the functional design approach summed up. We take these two elements, functions and data, and model them both in Ruby as plain objects. And we do use objects because Ruby is still at heart an object-oriented language. So we should acknowledge here that what we're really doing is creating a blend, a hybrid of functional and object-oriented programming styles. But in doing this, we do escape many of the pitfalls that all of those object-oriented design principles uh, were there to help us avoid in the first place. Because if you look at them closely, our functional objects already satisfy so many of these principles out of the box. They're already single responsibility. They're already open for extension, but closed for modification. And they're built from the ground up to prefer composition. So our functional code ends up being better object-oriented code, too. And we've done this with a blindingly simple approach. And it doesn't leave us wringing our hands at each point about which principles we need to conform to as we go and build our application. And this design approach is confirmed by the ease of testing as well. So let's take our import products class and write a unit test for it. So we start by recalling these two dependencies we were using, the download feed object and the product repo. And each of these represents an interaction with an external system, 
either a third-party remote uh, URL or our own database. And then we take them and we set them up as test doubles or mock objects. And then we can create our subject under test, our import products object, by creating the object and passing those doubles into the constructor. Then we create a real feed value to act as our input. And then we do one more thing. We set up our download feed object to return local fixture data whenever it's called with our feed. And with that setup done, we can now call our importer and then insert, assert that our repository has been asked to create a record for each of the products in that fixture file. That's it. And we could make this arrangement by, by working with those test doubles so easily because we designed our class to act with those abstract injected dependencies. So instead of having to actually go and interact with those two different external systems, the third party remote data feed, as well as our own database, or having to set up some sort of global stub for each of those, instead we could just simulate their behavior via these doubles, pass them into our function and test it quickly and in true isolation. So if there's been a strong theme so far, it's been about making our dependencies clear. And I think this is because it's one of the best things we can do to enable well-designed code. Once our dependencies are clear, we can more easily recognize that our app is really a graph of objects. And we've seen this before uh, with Alex's talk. The classes or the objects act as the nodes, and those dependency relationships are the edges. And if we take a hard look at those edges, at those dependency relationships, we can get a sense for just how well our designed our app is. If those edges are all arranged like this, so our app looks like a big directed acyclic graph, then it's a sign that we're going to you know, have a good time making change. On the other hand, if we had a graph where the arrows are all flowing in different directions or even becoming cyclic, then it's a sign we could be in trouble. That's going to be something that's harder to change. And that's why we take the time to establish an approach up front that will help us better design our apps, because these design approaches are there to make change easier. And good design is what gets us onto that happy, upward-sloping line of steady, consistent feature delivery. And it turns out that a functional approach to design is what gives us all of this. And it does so in a way that's really easy to follow, based around that widespread usage of functional objects and those clear composition of dependencies. Now, I know what you might be thinking right now. This is just one weird trick, and it might sound fine at a conference, but it'll never fly in the real world. It's just too impractical. You couldn't do this for a whole app. Well, I am happy to say that this is actually no weird trick, and it really does hold up to real world use. Uh, it's an approach we experimented with some years ago at IceLab, and we liked it so much that it's now our preferred way to build Ruby apps. And over the last two years, we've shipped more than 10 apps built with this stack in this way across different domains and with different levels of complexity. And each of these apps was built by small teams, just two or three people, people with varying levels of experience as Ruby programmers, and many of whom learned this approach on the job and still managed to get things done. So this is definitely something that can work today. And if it is sounding attractive to you, we don't need to worry about going out and forging your own path towards this kind of approach, because we now have a whole Ruby ecosystem that's grown up around this approach. And I want to introduce some of it to you now. Most of what I'll show you comes from the DryRB project. It's a project we founded over two years ago now, and we offer a collection of what we call next generation Ruby gems. And we call them this because, yes, they are informed by many lessons we've learned over the years building apps with Ruby, but they're also our real concerted attempt to nudge our ecosystem in a better direction. Each gem solves a single problem, and it can be used on its own, but you can also bring them all together to form a full web stack, which is what we've done at IceLab. And many of these gems are built specifically to support and encourage the design approaches we've looked at so far today. So let's take a look. The first gems I want to show you are the ones that help with dependency management. Now, if you're looking at the code before and wondering, well, how exactly would you go about doing this, about initializing these functional objects at the right place and the right time, and then getting and orchestrating that web of dependencies and making sure they're all available, especially when we're going to have more than hundreds of these things if we're building a full app in this way? Well, we have some gems to help with that. We have dry system and dry auto inject. 
And the first step is to drop Dry System into place. And that it offers a centralized container for accessing all of the functional objects in our app. So when we boot an app that works with Dry System, it populates con its container using a very simple approach. It starts by scanning our files like this. And then for each file, it'll register a matching identifier. And it'll do this until we have an identifier for every single functional object in our application. And then with all of that in place, we can now hop over back to our file from before, our import products class, and drop in this auto injection mix-in, which we use to straight up declare the dependencies that this class wants to work with. And we refer to them by their container identifiers. And dropping this mix in here takes care of all of the dependency related boilerplate that we had back in our original example. So we don't need to worry about an initializer, instance variable assignment, and attribute readers. That's all taken care of for us. And then it'll go on to do one more thing as well. Because now, when we go back to the container and actually fetch that object, we get back a pre-built instance with all of the dependencies resolved and provided automatically from our container. So it's ready for us to use. So that's how Dry System does its thing. It gives us the container for accessing our objects, and courtesy of the auto-injection mix-in, all of our dependency wiring gets taken care of for us. And with this in place, it becomes really manageable to build an app that consists of hundreds of objects like these. And it also becomes really low friction to extract behavior and wrap them up in its own object whenever we notice things becoming a bit too complex or when we notice the, the need for some more reusability. Just one more thing on this, though. While the auto-injection approach is helpful, it doesn't mean we give up control because we can still choose to manually instantiate our objects and manually pass in dependencies whenever we want. And this is actually quite a helpful approach for testing because we might now want to use a mix of dependencies with some being the system defaults and some being our test doubles. Now, that'll give us a less isolated test than before, uh, but it might make certain kinds of testing much more practical. So it's good we have the choice. All right, next we come to result handling. This is the other side of the functional object story. What do we do once we've called these and, and got some result? Well, these objects can become much more flexible and powerful if we make it so they all return the same kind of result object. And for this, we can turn to dry monads. Now, these are another element from functional programming languages. And we use them here simply to wrap up the return values from our functional objects. And we use it to signal whether their operation succeeded or failed. Now, without going any more into this as a, as a subject of theory, even just having this consistent result object allows us to provide something like this, this nice result matching API from DryMatcher. And this lets us just as easily act on both the success and failure outcomes from our calls to our functional objects. And looking at this, you can see we're improving the robustness of our apps by elevating failure handling to be a truly first-class concept. Failure handling, failures are handled in the very same way as successes, and matcher blocks like these won't even run unless you have all the cases covered. So those were some gems for powering up our functions. But what about our values, our data, the other half of functional application design? Well, we have some gems to help you here too. We can start by looking at dry validation. It helps us model our data validations with precision and safety and work with any kind of input data. And it's based around standalone validation schemas. So these can be tailored to suit each specific use case of our application. And then we can also put them as close as possible to the boundaries of our application and ensure only valid data makes it into our application's core. And then, once we're in the core and we want to work with the important structures that we pass around between our functional objects, we have dry types and dry struct. Dry types helps us identify, name, and reuse all the data types that exist inside our app and apply things like coercions and constraints along the way. And then dry struct helps us define strictly typed value objects consisting of multiple attributes, each with their own type definition. Now, working with uh, type structs like this means we can now be completely confident in the shape of the data that we receive in our functional objects. And we notice very quickly if we encounter uh, data along the way that doesn't match our expectations. 
All right, so our building blocks are looking pretty strong right now, but if we're going to build a fully working web app, we need to do a few more things. View rendering, for instance. Well, for this, we have drive view. And that helps us build our views as functional objects, just like we've been doing so far today. So we get full support for auto-injected dependencies, which means we can cleanly connect our views to the other parts of the app that they need to work with in order to render themselves. And we can then explicitly expose data to our templates, and we can also wrap that data up in custom view part classes for providing properly encapsulated, reusable, and testable view logic. And I really like working with DriveView because so often the server rendered view layer is where good design just falls apart, it doesn't get it out there. But now with DriveView, we can extend our same consistent design approach all the way out to our views as well. So if we can render some views, how do we get them to the user? Well, obviously we'll need to take care of HTTP and routing concerns. And for this we have a very small gem, Dry Web Rotor. And this integrates Dry System and DriveView with Jeremy Evans's Rotor web framework. And it makes it easy to do the few things that you'd want to do at the HTTP layer, like rendering your views and calling our functional objects and responding to their um, results. And this ends up being the only layer in our app where we ever have to deal with HTTP concerns, which leads the core of our app to focus on its own job and not be muddied up by having the HTTP le details leak all the way in. Dryweb Rotor also has a project generator, so you can run that and get started with a new app that um, has all these gems working together. Now, the one big thing that's missing still is database persistence. And for that, we can turn to ROM RB. It's a sister project of DryRB, and it shares all the same philosophies. It's also designed along functional lines, and it integrates really nicely into apps built with Dry System as well. And ROM gives us APIs to cleanly access every part of our database. And it helps us embrace the database and put all of its features to work for our application. But then, what it also does is help us hide away all of that persistence logic uh, from the rest of our app. Because when we work with ROM, we build up these repository classes, just like, just like in our example before, and these serve as the only interface to our persisted data. And what they return are properly typed value objects that are tailor-made to suit our application's business domain. So what have we looked at here? Well, pretty much everything you need to build a fully working web app written in functional Ruby. And we've satisfied each of these requirements with tools that encourage these good design choices along the way. And for me, it was working like this with these tools that finally made me feel like I jumped that gap. I was finally building things that felt solid from start to finish. And I found myself finally being able to deliver um, work at a much nicer, steadier pace. I'd finally hopped onto that red line, and I'd found myself a happier developer again. In fact, it was really the moment working with these tools that I rediscovered Joy and Ruby after what felt like years of a, of a long slog. And I owe it to this ecosystem of tools for making the approach, uh, this approach an easy one and a natural one to take. And I'm really excited right now because this idea of functional Ruby is moving beyond just a small set of tools. We're starting to see the beginning of what feels like a functional Ruby movement. And we can see this through a growing number of projects that are all gravitating around the same ideas. We've seen DryRB and ROMRB today, but there are more. Take Trailblazer. It offers a, a high-level business logic architecture for Ruby apps, and it works with any web front end. As a project, it's been around for a long time. But in their 2.0 release, they've adopted a real functional Ruby approach. They offer functional operation objects that offer some really advanced flow control behavior. And these operations fully support dependency auto-injection and apps built around containers like Dry System as well. And then we have Hanami. It's a modern, integrated web app framework. And they've made a big milestone just recently. It's now hit 1.0, so it's ready for you to use. And it's also oriented around single-purpose, stateless objects for all the different components that you'd expect to see in a web app. And there's already been some really interesting thinking that's already started to happen towards Hanami's 2.0 evolution. Just a few weeks ago at a Rails Club conference in Moscow, Luca Guidi, the lead developer, shared how they'd like to take things in an even more functional direction, basing the framework entirely around functional objects and building up processing pipelines for handling web requests. So all of this makes me feel that the Ruby community is ready for a change like this. 
And all these groups, Hanami, Dryabi, Trailblazer, we're all working hard and together to help make this ha happen. Victor Hugo said that there's nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. Now, I did joke earlier about functional programming being hot right now, and it is fun to poke at the flightiness of programming trends, but I really do think it's trending for a reason. It's an idea whose time has come. Again and again through the history of invention, we see that when the world is ready for an idea, when all those foundations have been laid, that idea won't come to just one person. It'll come to numerous people in numerous places. And when that happens, just like we're seeing with functional Ruby, well, then you know it's an idea worth paying attention to. And in this way, I think we're starting to bridge a real gap that's existed for a long time within our own community. I haven't forgotten how much we owe to Rails. It's the thing that it's the thing that got us most of us our jobs and ultimately brought us to places like this. But I think for the longest time, Rails has been perceived as the start and the finish of the Ruby story. People who wanted something different didn't really have a real place to go. And for people who felt like they wanted something different, well, they didn't really know where to look. And now we're starting to see such a place start to form around these communities and these tools. And this makes functional Ruby a real world thing. And as we've seen, it's something that can bring big improvements to your apps and your own real world situations as app developers as well. Because when we follow that approach, that hybrid approach of functional and object oriented programming in Ruby, we strike this amazing balance that really does help us build better designed, more maintainable applications. And then when we take this formula and add in our own Ruby community, our generous, welcoming, thoroughly decent community, things get even better. Because as Rubyists, we're all about making technology approachable and fun, regardless of the paradigm we want to follow. We want to help people level up, and we don't want to put barriers between people and the things they want to learn. And with Ruby, with all of its flexibility, as our community's shared mode of expression, there's really nowhere we can't go. And if functional Ruby is a place you'd like to go, well, trust me that you'll be supported there. Projects like DryRB and ROMRB, Trailblazer and Hanami, they're all here to help. And you can also feel confident that this is a thoroughly practical choice if you want to explore these approaches within Ruby. Not only because the language is pragmatic and flexible and it'll help you get things done, but also because you get to continue to leverage all of your existing knowledge of the language and our ecosystem. So I think this makes Functional Ruby really worth a try. It can help you build better apps and expand your mind at the same time. And if you would like to explore this with me, I suggest you check out this repository on GitHub. Uh, we're just getting started in building a best practices example app using the DryRB tools. So now would be a great time to start following along. And I've also gathered up a bunch of notes about today's talk on this link here. So if you want, you can refer back to that later to learn more. But besides that, thank you all so much for your time today, and I really hope you'll give this a chance the next time you start thinking about the way you build apps. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tim. Uh, one more thing, Tim is going to be hosting a workshop this Saturday. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about the workshop and what, what we can expect? Uh, well, I guess the tricky thing about uh, entire um, stacks of gems like the ones I showed you here is that it's very hard to convey in you know, 20 minutes just how they fit together and just the kind of benefits they can bring your app. So in the workshop, we'll have a whole day as a group and we're going to build the typical blog. Everyone knows how a blog works. But we'll do it with this entirely alternative ecosystem of tools and we'll get to understand all the details and all the nuances of how they fit together and, and how they can help you make more maintainable apps. Sure. Thank yeah. you very much. Uh, so I think we've run out of tickets for the, for the workshop. Yeah, it's Great sold for out. you, sir. Yep. And time for questions. What questions do you guys have? Sure, go ahead, please. Faris. Uh, are there any downsides to this? Have you found anything you didn't like about this? No, it's wonderful and magical. Everyone should do it. <laughs> <laughs> No, there, there's a learning curve because it's an approach that I guess as a community we haven't followed. So you do need to consider those things from a different angle. Um, it is a bunch of different tools to learn. And I guess our emphasis in building these tools is that we've been working from the bottom up. So we build the, the smaller logical units on their own first and then we think about how do they tie together. So you see a bit more of that integration happening at the surface level of your app. Um, 
So you sort of, it's not so much like dropping accept nested attributes for and then everything working, right? So it's, you, you, you build a little bit more of the machinery, but I think it's a good approach because it means you have more control around that machinery and you end up with places, you have these handholds in your app where if you need to make a change that affects just one part without having flow and ramifications, you've got that one place ready there for you. Uh, yeah, so it's really just the learning curve and the, app, the gems are relatively young still. Um, we're hoping to hit 1.0 in the next sort of four-ish months with a lot of them, but uh, yeah, I guess if you're, if you're keen, you can definitely work with them and put them all the way through to production. It's what we've done and I, and I feel like they really help. Cool, that's good one. Any other questions? No, it's not a question, but a comment. That can be kind of a similar problem the concept of change of positive application. And it's just a game. And I think the, the term really stuck with me, right? Because this is what you're describing that as like, applications that are all change. Maybe you want to really try to come up with because I think it's a really good concept. Yeah, so, Mikhail said, uh, I did another talk uh, last month in India where I. Um, introduce these as a way of helping you build a change positive application and really change is the biggest part of our job as programmers. Um, so I think we owe it to ourselves to, to pick tools that allow us to make the decisions that enable um, easier change later on. Like Alex was talking about that um, uh, in the DDD approaches but also just how we think about how we organize our objects and how they relate to each other and what I found is that working with tools like DryB and Dry System is that those approaches actually become uh, doable rather than having this big um, three buckets of MVC and like yeah. this big murky pool inside each one with no clear connections between them. Uh, so I feel like these gems make this approach something that's feasible and realistic and that was the thing I needed to uh, finally make that jump and build apps that felt change positive, easier to maintain. That's a good point. Did somebody say, ah, oh yes, go ahead, Louis. <laughs> uh, I don't remember a lot of Haskell, but I did, uh, I did some of it during my uni days. So what I do remember as the strengths of Haskell is, uh, one is uh, higher order functions. Uh, I can combine multiple, uh, I can pass functions as uh, arguments to other functions, mm -hmm. and I, uh, I have uh, absolute confidence that what I combine, regardless of how, uh, how deep I combine it, it will always work mm -hmm. because of the, the method signature. Mm -hmm. So that is uh, strong typing. That is something that Ruby doesn't have. So is there anything that uh, the, the dry framework can help with uh, reliability that, uh, to ensure that I don't, uh, I don't have a, a null object somewhere, uh, somewhere in, inside the chain which will blow up on me uh, later on? Uh, yeah, I guess firstly we have to recognize that Ruby isn't Haskell, so we don't have that sort of functional purity, but I think we can go a long way by following some conventions. And uh, I only hinted at it very quickly, but by wrapping up all of the results from our functional operations in an instance of the either monad, for instance, that means that um, we'll always have these um, result objects that require us to do extra steps to like get at the value, which adds to the safety of working on them. So. Um, you can say, I want to transform this value, but only if it was previously a success. And that means if it was a failure, it just skips that transformation and nothing blows up. So if it was like a random nil result somewhere, you don't get that, um, that nil error that we get so often in Ruby. And that's what lets us build together whole pipelines of operations that all work on the same value that gets passed from one to the other, and they'll safely operate from start to finish. And you know, that's, once you start to have that in your tool belt, it's amazingly powerful and it really helps you break like big sequences of logic down into individual units. And each of those units is like a screen full of code. So it's really easy to understand each one at a time, which really is, is freeing as an application developer, I think, because you're no longer having to keep all that state in your head. Does that answer the question, Louis? Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. Any last questions? Oh, yep. Go ahead, Andy in 500 words or less. <laughs> um, all right, um, so as, I mean, normally when we use Rails, right, we have all these, um, you know, pre-built gems, pre-built libraries that we can mm -hmm. use to um, mm -hmm. um, build application, um, you, know, you know, as fast as possible. 
Um, so is there any practices or any way to um, integrate um, dry RB into Rails? And at the same time, we can have um, the, uh, you know, we can use those um, libraries that um, um, we have been using, um, for example, device and uh, um, active, record, uh, active record and uh, stuff like that. Like it's like um, you know building a hybrid between uh, Rails and Dry RB. Uh, well, a lot of the Dry RB gems you can drop straight into a Rails app. So Dry validation, Dry types, Dry struct, um, Dry monads, all of those could be dropped straight into a Rails application, and you could start sort of uh, getting the benefits there. Um, because they're all things that everyone has to do, no matter what their web framework is. Everyone's got to validate data. Everyone's got to think about the way they're modeling the, the values in their system and passing them around. So I think that could help a lot with improving some of the, I guess, correctness uh, of Rails apps. Uh, on the other hand, um, if you're building an app entirely out of this alternative stack, then yeah, there'll be gems out there in our ecosystem that don't drop right in. Like you couldn't drop Devise in because it's a Rails engine. Uh, but what it, what we can do still is we can use a lot of the, uh, the gems that underpin things like Devise. So Warden, for instance, is the authentication framework that it rests on. That works with any Rack app. And a lot of our um, gems out there do work with any Rack app. But the thing that becomes really clear once you stop working within Rails is just how much of our ecosystem is built to be dropped into a Rails app and doesn't have a useful core on its own. And so it's made me really aware of what I feel like the best approach is if we're building gems in the Ruby community, which is to build the core of our offering first, free of any integrations, so anyone can use it, and then wrap around optionally those integrations with frameworks. Because uh, I think that will be a thing that keeps our community more healthy, because we're not tied to a, like a, a single monoculture and a single um, big framework together. But yeah, you, so you can use a ton of the gems and drop them straight into a Rails app. Um, uh, even, even things like ROM, which is a completely different persistence system, can be used within Rails as well. And I think Using, using ROM within Rails could be one of the best things you, best decisions you make because it really is built from the ground up to separate application logic from the persistence layer, uh, which really untangles a whole lot of the things that do make life a bit difficult when you have a, like a long-lived Rails app. All right, thank you. Cool, we'll take one last question. And right before that we go, and right after that we're gonna do the lucky draw. Mm -hmm. One last question, please. Yep, yep, yep. Sure. <laughs> uh, have you tried a idea of CQRS in Rails? Uh, it's a command query re responsibility segregation pattern. Yes, uh, that's, that's basically the founding pattern of ROM. Uh, so command and queries uh, in database language effectively map to reads and writes. Um, and ROM has us model them both as separate objects. So we have relations which uh, basically are the things that map to database tables. And in our relation classes, we write all the low-level reusable query logic. And then we have commands. And commands are about writing back to tables. And commands are actually the low-level thing underneath change sets, which are a higher-level abstraction for working with data that we want to send back to our persistence layer. And yeah, that's been a really good pattern to, to follow because reading and writing are distinctly different activities. And they don't need to be muddled together in, in single classes. And Again, that's helped us untangle a whole lot of um, persistence-related logic and have a clear pathway for each of those different activities. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much, Tim. One more round of applause, please. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.